thank you again for your uh, your welcome and uh, I'm, I'm glad that you had a good rest and have been able to enjoy something of, of the surroundings here which are really very lovely. Uh, yesterday we, we kind of began by, by looking at chapter 1, a bit of chapter 2 and uh, a reminder that the, the church survived what was um, a great crisis, the, the crisis that one of the twelve um, had abandoned uh, the, the others and they needed to appoint another and it's a reminder at the very beginning of the book of the Acts of the Apostles that church is not always smooth sailing, you do hit um, bumps in the road but the bumps in the road do not destroy the purposes of God. But even those things which could you know, threaten people's well-being, um, threaten the sense that all things are, are going well, that you know, the bumps are what we climb on. Uh, that, that, that's, the, that, that, that's the lesson of the early part of, of Acts chapter 1. That uh, we, we don't have a bump-free road, but we learn that the bumps are, are what help us to, to make progress. Now it's always good to have a, a good start, and uh, it's been great to, um, to see the, the start that Beach Hill Church has had in their new premises. It was lovely to be with you um, at the beginning of November and to, to witness um, the, the church there in that new place and new faces. And I know that since then there have been additional new people that have come. Fresh start is always good, so encouraging to, um, to see new people. The Acts of the Apostles uh, begins with a good start. The, the amazing events of, of Pentecost, the bringing into the church of 3,000 people on a day, that's remarkable. But it's important to remember that whether it be in the early church or <coughs> in the church of today, that it's not sunshine every day in the church of Jesus Christ that shadows sometimes form and cast themselves over um, the Church of Jesus Christ. And shadows can be threatening. And the threats can come from outside and the threats can come from inside. It's important to recognise both of those things and recognise that we need to be prepared for both of them. It's going to be interesting going to Latvia in 1993 for the first time and, and recognising that Many of the church leaders were equipped for leading a church during a time of communism where the, the, the challenge was external. But when uh, the, the wall came down and, and when freedoms came, the challenges so often to the health of the church were not from outside, but from the inside. And it required a completely different kind of skill set, a completely different kind of approach uh, by the church. And, and, and in our reading, we, we see that shadows fall and threaten the church and some of those threats come from the authorities outside of the church and some of those threats come from those who appear to be fully paid up members of the local church. Now we've, um, we've jumped over a fairly big section from the, the, the end of chapter 2 um, to our reading and, and that bit in chapters 3 and 4 is one of those times when Luke tells a, a really big story, a very significant story, in a large chunk of his book. And it's a story about a man who was born lame and for 40 years was unable to move. It's what I kind of think of as, as having frozen assets. Um, a lot of human beings have frozen assets, economically, physically, emotionally, relationally. They simply are not in the place where they can flourish. They are hindered in some way or another. And it's the story of how, through the Gospel, Peter and John come to this man and give him hope. Hope by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, but also um, a release from these frozen assets so that he's able to move, to, to leap, to jump, and to praise God. It's a, it's a great acted parable of the difference that Jesus can make in a life and in a community. Now, uh, the challenge of all that is that, you know, when you're, as we saw last night in chapter 1, 120 people in an upper room, 
having a prayer meeting, you're having a great time, there's a lot of internal impact, but no one's noticing what you're doing. In fact, most of the time, no one really notices what the church is doing. And no one is really particularly bothered about what the church is doing, as long as they don't mess with them. But as soon as the church, in some way, spills over from its private enclave into um, the public square, suddenly people have to make a response. Now, sometimes the response is further indifference. Sometimes the, the response is a sense of wonder and uh, a desire to explore, and sometimes it is hostility. You know, it's going to make a difference. If, if the, what these people are saying is true, I need to take God seriously. I need to uh, think about God myself. And what happened, verses 21 and 22, is that Peter and John are censored. They're told, stop speaking in the name of Jesus. Now there are places in Britain where, where people are squeezed with some measure of censorship. There are places where people um, are told that they shouldn't um, speak too loudly about their Christian faith. Of course there are parts of the world where, where people um, experience great hostility because they speak about the Lord Jesus Christ, where they'll be harassed, where they might lose their jobs, where they might lose their freedom or their lives. We, we always have lived in a time where the Christian gospel does receive a sense of censorship and hostility. Stop speaking about this man, Jesus. I don't want to hear any more. This is just too disruptive. Of course, it is a disruptive message, isn't it? The message of Jesus disrupts the equilibrium of, of, of human life. It makes you kind of come up short and think, well, okay, if what's being said about him is true, things need to be very different in my life. Things need to be very different in my world. There is always a, an internal challenge in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But of course, um, the response of the Christian gospel, the apostles here in, in, in the beginning of the Acts of the Apostles, and around the world where hostility comes in and, and challenges the gospel of, of Jesus, is that there's a pushback against that censorship. And, and there in verses um, uh, 21 and, and 22, um, we read that the apostles were let go um, because they couldn't decide how to punish them because all the people were praising um, God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was 40 years old. Something had happened. Um, they couldn't escape that. Um, and yet, they want to try and stop what is being done. Um, and the apostles respond there in verse 19, but Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. I remember that story um, I read as a teenager of the, uh, the Chinese Christian watchman Ni, who was challenged by some armed forces in China um, about his enthusiasm for the gospel. And he said, you know, if you chop my head off, it will continue preaching the love of Jesus as it rolls down the hill. Now, of course, we, we know that's not actually true. That, that, that wouldn't happen. Um, that, that there isn't that kind of um, nerve activity after a head is chopped. But you, 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 you grasp the sentiment <clears throat> that you're not going to stop. You're not going to stop the gospel by telling people to stop telling people about Jesus. So that's the kind of context of, of our reading. Um, this, this man <coughs> totally liberated, his, his assets unfrozen, and then the church prays. And we saw this yesterday, that the, the church began to learn to pray, and the instinctive response to this particular situation is prayer. The first base for the early church is to speak to God about this, and the first base of the Christian church in the 21st century, their first response to every threat, to every question, to every decision is, let's speak to God about this. 
and we see the, the people praying. Now, just take a moment to try and take in that slide. You might not be able to read all the detail, but it's a, it's a list of all the references to prayer in Luke and Acts. It's one of the features, one of the remarkable features of Luke and Acts, that Luke highlights the key moments in the life of Jesus where he prays, and he highlights the key moments in the story of the church where they pray. And it is very much the backbone of the spiritual life and vitality <laughs> of Jesus and the apostles. Luke wants to highlight that. You know, it's, it, it's not just something that appears here and there. We saw it yesterday. We're seeing it this morning. We'll see it at tea time. We'll see it to a certain extent tomorrow morning. The church that prays <coughs> is the church. You know, we, we've been told to breathe this weekend. One of the things about breathing, it's an interesting kind of idea, the idea of breathing, isn't it? All scripture has been um, breathed out by God. We, when, we, when we read, when we listen, we're experiencing the breath of God. When we pray, we're breathing out our requests to God. Christianity is about breathing in, breathing out. Breathing in, breathing out. Breathing in God's word. Breathing out our prayers. And those two things that we'll see are, are related. And again, we see this idea of togetherness. Um, so, on their release, verse 24, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. We said that um, the, the power of prayer is not necessarily um, having you know, a huge amount of people doing it. Uh, that, that, that somehow, you know, if you've got ten, it's better than one. The, the whole point of praying together is that you are praying together. You are praying in unison. You're praying off the same hymn sheet, as it were. You've agreed together that this is what you are seeking God for. And I remind you what I said yesterday. It's a helpful thing for the church to think about what are the things we are praying for. What in 2022 are we particularly praying for that we desire God to do amongst us and through us? And consistently agreeing to pray those things when you meet publicly and pray those things when you pray individually. It's about being on the same page. Now, what interests me about this prayer is that it's a prayer that, you know, it's not made up in the moment. It's a prayer that takes the words of Psalm 2 and prays those words. It's kind of interesting, isn't it, in the New Testament, there's no equivalent book to the book of Psalms. There is no New Testament book of Psalms. Because this was the, uh, the book, the prayer book, the song book, which was used by the, the early church as well as the believers in the Old Testament. And when they turn to pray, they turn to a psalm, and they turn to this particular psalm. And it's not a random use of this psalm, because it's a psalm that speaks about the hostility of authorities toward the one who is God's anointed one. I was in Cambridge um, a few weeks ago, and I was chatting to a chap called Steve Walton. Steve Walton is a New Testament commentator. He was writing a commentary on Acts, and I said to him, well, I'm really interested in Acts chapter 3 and 4. Uh, I'd be very interested to see what you've been writing about it. Um, uh, it was a bit of a cheeky request, really, because it hasn't been published yet. But he did send me um, some samples. And, and one of the things he said, which I thought was really helpful, about this, this, this prayer based on Psalm 2, is that this prayer demonstrates that the praying church is a hermeneutical church. Sorry about throwing that word in on a Saturday morning. A hermeneutical church. Hermeneutics is about the, the, the art and science of reading scripture well. It's a human, hermeneutical church, hermeneutical prayer, because it's praying through the lens of scripture. And when we pray through the lens of scripture, it's, it's almost like, you know, we're at the bowling alley, and uh, you've got those kind of, you know, 
um, inflatable uh, things at the stabilizers at the side. You kind of know you're not going to lose the ball to another lane. You, might, you still might not get the 10, um, the, the 10 strike, but you know it's not going to be an absolute abject disaster. It's going to stay in the lane. And, and that's the thing with, 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 with scripture. Scripture for praying, it is a little bit like having those stabilizers that, that guide us and direct us in a, in a path that God's people have prayed in before. <coughs> And, and God has authorised as a, a way of uh, prayerfully interacting with him. They've experienced arrest and imprisonment and harassment because of the name of Jesus. And here's a psalm that speaks about the authorities rebelling against those who are followers of the Anointed One, the Christ. Now... What happens when we pray? Something happens. Um, something happens to, to us. Something happens to our world. There's always something that happens when we pray. And it's interesting to see um, what the, the people in, um, in Acts chapter 4 pray for. Um, they pray um, to, to God. Um, now. Now, Lord, look on this threat and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. It's kind of a, an interesting thing, isn't it? Um, God knows everything, but sometimes in prayer we, we do say things like this. Lord, will you look at this? Will you consider this? We bring our concerns to God in prayer. We lay them before him. And we ask him to make a difference. That's why we're praying. We're, we're asking him that he might uh, make a difference in the world. Stretch up your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. May your word go forth and may there be um, evidence of the power of the work of Jesus in our world. And when they prayed, the place was shaken. Now, we, we heard the comment of a little girl who uh, had the explanation of Pentecost um, given to her in a, in a class and, and saying, you know, well, we must have missed that Sunday, Dr. Long. I wonder if, I wonder if you've kind of experienced anything approaching a shaking as people have prayed. I guess we'd probably feel a little nervous, wouldn't we, if, um, if, if there was some kind of physical shaking as we prayed. Uh, maybe we're not shaken, but we're stirred when we pray, um, just to use um, a little bondism. We kind of expect something to happen when we pray, don't we? Or do we? Do we expect there to be an impact of our crying out to God? Like these words of Jonathan Edwards, who said, We see by experience that a remarkable pouring out of God's Spirit is always attended with an effect, a great increase in the performance of prayer. When the Spirit of God begins a work in men's hearts, it immediately sets them calling on the name of the Lord. Yeah, when, when the Spirit of God is at work, people pray. And, and when people pray, the Spirit of God is at work. You kind of expect there to be some impact. You don't expect to be calling out to God and, and, and nothing to happen. You expect there to be some kind of impact. Now, I, I said yesterday when we thought about the, uh, the apostles flicking a coin or, or casting lots for the, um, the decision about the replacement of Judas, that sometimes in the Acts of the Apostles we need to ask the question, is this a description or is this a prescription? Is this a description of what happened or is this a prescription of what will happen in the church now forever? Um, is, is Luke saying, look what happened here um, in Jerusalem on this particular occasion? Or is he saying, look at what happened in Jerusalem on this particular occasion, and that's how the church needs to be today? That's an important question to deal with, isn't it? Um, 
What does Luke intend? Now, I've been really helped by a couple of verses um, that kind of eliminate this. Um, Luke 5, 17, where we're told that the, the power of the Lord was present for Jesus to heal the sick. Kind of an interesting comment, isn't it, from Luke? The power of the Lord was present for Jesus to heal the sick. And the kind of assumption is that um, it wasn't necessarily always evenly distributed through the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. There were exceptional moments and exceptional times. Or Acts 19 verse 11, where we're told that in, in Ephesus, um, Paul performed extraordinary miracles. And that's an extraordinary kind of statement, isn't it? To read um, in the Acts of the Apostles. Because after all, the things that we actually read generally are extraordinary. So for the Apostle Paul, there were occasions when there were things that were done which were <clears throat> unusual. Unusual even for him. So I kind of think, you know, do miracles happen? Some people say, well, miracles never happen. That was all back then. Some people say, miracles always happen. You know, we can just turn on the tap and everything will be transformed. I like to think that miracles sometimes happen. Not in my control, not in my gift. I can't switch it on. But sometimes God does things that are beyond the sum of the parts of what we do, what we say, and what we pray. If that wasn't the case, we'd live in a kind of closed universe. And you wonder kind of what God we were dealing with. When we pray, as, as we pray in Ephesians chapter 3, that he's able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. Well, what can you imagine? What does that mean? When we pray... Astonishing things can happen, can't they? People who are hardened in unbelief can believe. People who are sick can be made well. People who are in the grip of evil forces can be set free. Intractable situations in the life of the church can suddenly be resolved. Difficult people can change. We believe that, don't we? We don't have control over that, we're, because in praying we're asking, we're not demanding. But in prayer, the church in Jerusalem responded to this crisis by calling upon God to act. And they were together in doing that. And as they come through this situation, this crisis, and as they are equipped to speak the word of God boldly, we have another description of the, of the church and the way it lived. Uh, another description like the one that we saw in, in chapter 2. There in verses 32, um, following of chapter 4, all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions were, was their own, but they shared everything they had. And of course, here we are again, you know, is this a description or is this a prescription? Is this what's always to be the case? Um, should we all kind of pull our wallets here and, um, um, and share it around? I've not got much in my wallet, actually, so I think probably um, I might well do well out of it. Is that, is that, is that what we should do? Um, we'll, kind of, we'll come back to that in a moment. But what was certainly the case was that there was a, a freeness amongst this congregation of God's people. A freeness about what they owned and what they had. What they had was not the most important thing about their identity anymore. They used to kind of say, didn't they? It kind of remind me of I kind of see all these kind of you know, old country houses and castles around here. You know, a Jane Austen question. Um, what is he worth? Of course, you know, the question, what is he worth, means how much money has he got? What does he get a year? Of course, when you, when you become a Christian, you don't think in those terms of what you're worth. Our worth is not suddenly um, about our assets. It's about the treasure that we have in Christ. Mm -hmm. Suddenly we're set free, aren't we? We're set free from 
the consuming desire to consume. And suddenly the, the grasper becomes a giver. That's the remarkable thing about the Christian gospel, isn't it? It turns people who grumble into grateful people. It turns people who are grasping into generous people. The grace of God tenderizes the human heart. It makes us open. It makes us responsive. So it, it doesn't matter so much that I have this. That I keep this. I'm okay about sharing this with you. Because although I've worked all my life for this, and although I value the comfort it brings, I realise that this is not the supreme comfort of human life. In fact, I've come to realise what Paul says to the Corinthians. That it's better to give than to receive. That God loves a cheerful giver. That somehow there's better than piling it all up and gloating over the pile like the rich fool in the parable. There is great joy in thinking that God has freed my heart to give rather than grab. That is remarkable, isn't it? It was remarkable in the early church that people would give and did give. And the result of this freeness was that there was a freeness in their witness. They were free from um, the kind of things which would normally occupy their mind, the, the need to make money and to keep um, making money, that they had time to do something else. So with great power, the apostles there in verse 33 continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all. I think both halves of that statement are really important, aren't they? When the community of Jesus Christ is an authentic community of Jesus Christ, when it lives like the Church of Jesus Christ, it is a wonderful platform for preachers to preach about the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because you know, if people are talking about the power of Jesus Christ and yet there's no evidence of the power of Jesus Christ in the transformed lives of the church, the message appears to be hollow. There's power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. People look around and say, well, where is it? Where is it? They testify to the resurrection of Jesus and much grace was upon them. You know, grace is a beautiful thing, isn't it? Grace is something which is attractive. This is a lovely community to belong to, what we're reading about here in chapter 4. These are people who have been tenderised by grace. These are people who have been softened by encountering the graciousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Great grace was upon them. They're obviously enabled by a force that you don't normally encounter in human life. Hard-boiled people. Difficult to negotiate with people. That's what you normally encounter in human life. Suddenly though, here's a community of God's people that have got something about them that is marked by grace. This is, this is beautiful. This is attractive. This is not off-putting. Something that I would like to be part of. And that statement, what an interesting statement. There were no needy persons among them. Now the disciples had asked in chapter 1, is this, is this the time that we're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus didn't answer the question. But of course the, the man who had been lame for 40 years and was raised is kind of almost like um, a fulfilment of Ezekiel 37, the Valley of Dry Bones. Um, a, a, a whole army of bones unable to rise and suddenly the gospel comes and that which is unable to move is raised and praises the living God. And now we have this fulfilment of Deuteronomy 15, the law. In the law, the, the ideal was that no one in the community of faith should be needy. No one should um, lack the things which are essential 
in human life, there was no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them and brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet. Uh, and that suggests that you know, people did retain a certain measure of control of their personal property. They didn't kind of give it all away. Um, from time to time, um, that happened. It's a really very radical kind of action. I was uh, watching a, a cooking program from a few months ago, and a couple of guys were travelling around Italy, and they were talking about their experience of going to two restaurants. In the first restaurant, they said that they had wonderful food and the service was excellent. And that's always a plus, isn't it, when you, when you enjoy a good meal. In the second restaurant, they said, uh, I think it possibly wasn't a monastery, um, um, but, but it wasn't necessarily because it was in the monastery that, um, um, that they said this. But in the monastery, what they experienced was really good food, great service, but something more, they experienced hospitality. Now there's a difference, isn't there? There's a difference between someone, you know, waiting on you for their job, and the real difference when, when people are hospitable. No needy people among them. Uh, people feeling that they were included, people feeling that their needs were being met, people who felt that they were being ministered to, People who felt they were being served. Now sometimes the Church of Jesus Christ is kind of a little bit like a building with lots of bouncers at the door. People in black suits with their arms folded and sunglasses when it's not sunny. <laughs> Church of Jesus Christ, open arms, greeters, givers, welcomers. You, know, you just might find that here is a group of people that can help you flourish. Here's a group of people that might help you to find what you have need of. Now, of course, it's not just money, is it? Uh, we we kind of live uh, in a time where for some people, um, they're money rich, but time poor. Some people, you know, their, their need is, they just need time. And well, some people in the church have got lots of time. It's kind of wonderful how sometimes the, the way that we serve other people and their needs is by helping them with our time. You know, easing their pressure. Maybe, you know, a really busy family that might need um, some babysitting help, or just a, an hour or so, um, taking the children to the play park or something. Or, or maybe someone at the other end of the, the spectrum who has an um, elderly parent living at home and it is 24-7. Someone who might give their time to sit with such a person, to cut their toenails, to do their hair, to allow the, the carer to, to go out and have a day out. There are no needy persons among them. Of course, we, we will face, I guess, um, a measure of economic challenges as churches in the next um, few years. As people are squeezed, as, as bills rise, utility bills and other bills rise, and maybe there will be a need to, um, to cash in the ISA and to, um, to, to help people who are struggling with their financial circumstances. It can make such a difference. I remember early on in, in, in the church in, in Lowestoft, um, uh, just realising <coughs> that for some households, <coughs> the washing machine was a, a really important asset, a large family, and a washing machine breaking down was a, was a real challenge. And that to buy a washing machine, a new washing machine, was a huge financial outlay and for some people it meant getting a, a really bad deal on a debt 
that meant they were spending probably three times as much as they would normally spend on their washing machine because of their repayments or, or taking out a really outrageous loan from a loan shark in their community and finding that they were not, not paying back two or three times more but ten times more than the cost of the item. And from time to time we as a church would say, well okay, if you need an item like that, we'll lend you the money. You pay us back. It doesn't matter how, how small it is, if it's a pound a week, you do that um, to assist people in those circumstances. It was an astonishing community and a great visual aid. The church was generous. And I think the church ought to be characterised by generosity. Generosity of spirit, generosity with our time, generosity with our assets. Um, we are devoted to the fellowship, that's what we read yesterday, the participation of the church. We are truly in it together. And we have an example of one of these individuals, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles named Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He sold the field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. I wonder if you had a name that um, expressed your character and your ministry, what would your name be? I, mean, I think it's rather lovely, isn't it, to have a name that means encouragement, son of encouragement. It's a great name, isn't it? You kind of wonder whether in some churches there might be people whose characteristic name would be miserable old so-and-so. <laughs> <laughs> or tight-fisted. That's not a reference to any Yorkshire people present, of course, as you realise. <laughs> what would your name be if you were the name that characterised your life and ministry in the church? What would people think about you? How would they name you? I kind of hope, I kind of hope it would be a kind of a generous name, uh, a kind name, rather than um, a stingy name. I like this kind of idea too, you know, the, that Barnabas brought the money and he, he kind of placed it at the apostles' feet. There's, there's something you know, really intentional, personal, and tactile about that, isn't it? The church is a, is a contact sport, isn't it? The church meets, it rubs up against each other. Um, you know, we don't do all the things that we do in a hidden way. You know, sometimes we, we assume, don't we, that all giving needs to be you know, completely kind of private. It's kind of interesting how public this was, um, because not not to draw attention to them, but just the recognition that um, that that they were that they were pleased to serve, they were pleased to give. But then, of course, this this beautiful picture, a shadow comes over the beautiful picture. That in the church there is the good, there's the bad, and there is the ugly. No church is kind of evenly positive, evenly good. We're a mixed bunch. One friend of mine, a pastor, used to say, you know, pastor in a church is a little bit like trying to um, manage a bag of ferrets. <laughs> that was not my quote, it's his quote. <laughs> you know, ferrets, you kind of get, you imagine they kind of go in lots of different directions at once. So kind of, they nip and bite as well, don't they? The church of Jesus Christ is a mixed bag. And if you're in a community of generosity and trust, there will be people who will disappoint you. Of course, we're coming back to chapter 1, aren't we? The disciples, the 12, needing to appoint a replacement for Judas. They had experienced the disappointment of one of them not coming up to the mark of their expectations. And of course, it's one of the natures of growing as a church that as you get more people coming to the church, there's more potential for people being fantastic, but also more potential for people being a disappointment. Every, every human being that comes into the world is either someone who will change the world for good or wreck it. In the Church of Jesus Christ there are those who build the church and build up people, and there are also people that can be toxic 
and corrosive in their presence. Ananias and Sapphira. Sapphira, ironically, means beautiful. And th there was obviously something very impressive about this couple. They were beautiful people. They were well-connected people. They had the kind of assets to make the gesture of selling property and giving it publicly, bringing it to the feet of the apostles. There is a certain magnificence and beauty about this couple. I remember being in Amsterdam on, on, a, on a boat called the Ark. It was a, a YWAM boat. And hearing um, a, a guy from the Middle East preaching, he, he spoke like an angel. He looked great as well, actually. But when I visited again a year or two later, they told me the story of the way he'd wrecked that place and abused his position, his influence, his beauty to, to spoil and pollute that particular situation. Ananias and Sapphira, we know the story, we've read the story. Um, they agree together, we've, we've sold our land and we're going to give all the pre proceeds to the church, but in fact, they intend to keep back some of the proceeds. That's what they decide. And of course, they come one after the other. Ananias comes first, and he says, yeah, it's, it's all of it. And Peter, with authoritative word, the one who has spoken an authoritative word of life, now speaks an authoritative word of judgment. And the man falls dead and is carried away by the young men. I guess that's probably one of the things in Acts that most of us don't want to see replicated on Sunday morning too often. And then Sapphira turns up and Peter gives her a chance to, he doesn't, she doesn't know what's happened before, it's a bit like one of those Mr and Mrs shows. He turn, she turns up and he says, well, have you, have you um, sold this and you're giving everything? And she says, yes. And then the authoritative word of judgment comes to her too. And she dies and she's taken out by the young men. An ugly action leading to a really scary judgment. There are kind of cases, aren't there, in 1 Corinthians 5, 1 Corinthians 11, where Paul talks about the judgment of the church. Were these people believers? Well, you know, there seems to be a kind of a, um, both a mixture about them, a mixture of what appears to be a beautiful gesture and the ugliness of something which is something else. Like clouds and wind without rain is one who boasts in gifts never given. Now of course there are lots of people like that, aren't there? You know, you know when, when someone is talking about doing something, they're, they're keen. You know, a bit like the story of the, the two sons in the Gospels, you know, one son who says, yeah, I'll do it, but doesn't turn up. You know, we need to be very careful, don't we, what we promise, what we <coughs> say we'll do, what we intend to do, that we kind of deliver on that. These people didn't deliver on that. What they wanted was a cut, pri a cut price um, blessing. They wanted the blessing of, of appearing generous without paying the full price of the generosity. And it's kind of reasoning like this, you know, God, how little can I give you and still look good as a Christian? How little can I get away with in terms of commitment and still apparently bask in the blessing of being a faithful person? What's the bare minimum that I can get away with in terms of still looking good? in your sight. The words of, of Peter have astonishing power. The lie is cast away. Um, Ananias and Sapphira die and the whole church, we're told there in verse 11, experience great fear that comes upon them. And we need to be very careful, don't we? Careful about what you say to God, careful about what you say to people, Careful about what you claim about yourself. It's better to claim low and kind of deliver high rather than the other way around. You see, what Ananias had done, 
Peter says, is lie to God and lie to the Holy Spirit. Um, I, I kind of like that, 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 um, that idea that um, someone speaks about, um, that what's the most important conversation you have every day? Um, and we might say, well, our most important conversation is our conversation with God. But some would say that, no, in fact, the, the most important conversation we have is the conversation we have with ourselves, where we talk to ourselves about who we are and how we present ourselves to be, to be what we claim to be, the words of our promises, what seem to be our intentions. The, that, that kind of conversation is, is really important. Um, we all know, don't we, um, the idea of faking it. It is possible, isn't it, to, to fake Christianity. To fake being a person of praise or a person of prayer. Uh, to fake being friendly. It's possible to do, isn't it? Um, but, but God doesn't want us to fake it. He'd rather, he'd rather that we had the two small coins that the widow brings, but with a heart of complete devotion to him, than one of those kind of big checks that are delivered on children in need, you know, from Tesco's. You kind of think, you know, 10,000 quid. How much would that advert cost? Anyway, no. Um, <laughs> I'd rather have the little with a heart than the big with no heart. Put the sign over your churches, let's pretend, and then you won't need to be dishonest about your words and actions. But we haven't put the sign, let's pretend, over our churches. So therefore, God expects, and we should expect, for us to be real and to be honest. I was reading a, a book by the Bishop of York, Archbishop of York, a book called Dear England. And he wrote the book as a result of being in a cafe, Cafe Nero, at Paddington Station, and having a chat with a young woman. And the young woman said to him, um, what made you become a priest? And they began to have a bit of a chat about that. And the, the lady said something very interesting. She said this, um, when she met people of faith, she found that they fell into two categories. For the first group, it seemed like it was their hobby. And it was true of people who went to the church, synagogue, and the mosque. It didn't seem to make any difference to the way that they led their lives, except for the fact they went to church on a Sunday or the other places on their special day. The other group, Embrace their faith tightly. It frightened everyone away. Perhaps we've encountered that. In churches where people really hold their faith very tightly. But it's so scary, it scares everyone away. It intimidates people. And she said, is there another way? Is there another way? And I think that's the question, isn't it, of the Acts of the Apostles. Is, is there another way to be church? Is there a way which is... Bold, generous, open, real, and honest. Come back to that idea. Don't come to church, be the church. Oh, we've reached 11 o'clock, that's coffee time. There's <laughs> one, one last thing to say. Um, well, let's read you something from a man called Dietrich Bonhoeffer about the church. And it's really important um, concerning what we've been saying today. Those who love their dream of a Christian community, more than the Christian community itself, become destroyers of that Christian community, even though their personal intentions may be ever so honest, earnest and sacrificial. God hates this wishful dreaming because it makes the dreamer proud and pretentious. Those who dream of this idealised community demand that it be fulfilled by God, by others and by themselves. They enter the community of Christians with their demands, set up their own law, and judge one another, and even God, accordingly. They stand adamant, a living reproach to all others in the circle of the community. 
They act as if they have to create the Christian community as if their visionary ideal binds the people together. Whatever does not go their way, they call a failure. When their idealised image is shattered, they see their community breaking into pieces. So they first become accusers of other Christians in the community, then accusers of God, and finally desperate accusers of themselves. There is a difference, isn't there, between a dream that destroys people because it's unrealistic, and a vision, a vision of reality empowered by the Holy Spirit that makes us the real people of God. Embrace that vision. Amen. Amen.